It is now my pleasure to also introduce um, Professor Rob Moody. Um, so Rob, I actually, as you can see from his bio, he's um, now Professor of Global Health at the Nossel Institute for um, Global Health here at uh, the University of Melbourne. Uh, I first um, met Rob, well, I think I'd met him before, but I got to know Rob um, when he was chair of the National Preventative Health Task Force. And one of the things that struck me about Rob at that time was his ability to manoeuvre through the governmental process um, a quite controversial document, which was the National Preventative Health Strategy. To us public health people, it didn't seem controversial, but the implications of implementation of some of that strategy was... Um, and Rob managed to negotiate that through um, the government at a time when I know that there was quite a bit of opposition to some of the recommendations. So I think Rob is the, uh, the perfect person to talk to us about um, climate change and getting our voice heard. So thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Linda. And um, it's great to to follow someone um, like Fiona. So I'll try and keep up with her level of energy, although that's pretty hard. Um, and uh, just to congratulate you. I mean, uh, as I said before, a few years ago, uh, not many people would have been in this room and looking at this enormously enthusiastic group now. Uh, and this is, a, I guess, this talk is about having your voice heard because you, we have as much right as anybody else um, to have our voice heard. And the point really is that science is on our side, but as we'll see, science is, is, simply, is simply not enough. One lesson, it's called three Ps, persistence, persistence, and persistence. That's the one lesson I'd like, or the one big message I'd like to uh, leave with you today. And we can learn from a number of issues, I think, that, that uh, in the sort of public health world that we've been reasonably successful with, and we'll, I'll allude to some of these examples um, and some lessons that we can draw from them. But it does take time. Um, we do need to gather evidence is utterly important, but as we'll see, it's simply not sufficient. We have to create constituencies. Um, we have to work out our strategy. We have to... We know, or to a certain extent, have to better define who's against us, um, and we have to frame, frame the debate. And also, increasingly, we have to understand how we're being framed, because this is not an inert world. There are some nasty people out there, um, and they really want to do the ideas of, of uh, the relationship between climate change and health uh, uh, in, and you need to work on tactics. But the goals of advocacy, the goals of any of this sort of work, are invariably contested actively or passively. In this case, they're actively participated. There are millions of, well, not millions, but millions of dollars, um, certainly, and thousands of minds actively trying to undermine, undermine what you want to do, what we want to do in climate change and health. They're not sitting there benignly just saying, oh, well, maybe we disagree with this. They're working actively um, to undermine certainly the public health aspects of this. So it's a, it's a fight. I can't see it in any other way. This is not let's shake hands and let's agree on this and let's see if we can work together. I think those days are gone. This is about a, a, a contest and as... as uh, uh, Fiona said it's, a, it's, it's in the realms of politics. Politics just means humans. I don't think politics means much more than that. It's just about humans, the way we actually act and interact with each other, um, and whether it's in a hospital or whether it's in, uh, in the community or whether it's in, in government. Um, it's, a, it's about a contest. And as I said, it takes time. If you look at uh, uh, good public health and it's progressive, uh, it's determined, it's comprehensive, it's sustained, and it takes decades. Sometimes you get some quick wins, most often you don't get very quick wins. If you look at tobacco control in Australia, um, then if you go back to even just the, the, um, uh, the 1980s, then, uh, whoops. Then, you know, so that's meant to be the no butts campaign rather than no bulls campaign. Um, <laughs> But uh, never mind. Uh, but you can see, I mean, these are, these are points of intervention. 
all of which were required, an enormous amount of organisation, advocacy, enormous amount of gathering of evidence. It was, this was people who are fundamentally very well organised um, and never give up. Uh, in a sense, that's what we have to do in this area. It's obviously coming, uh, coming further down. But uh, this is just to show that this has to be comprehensive. It has to be um, uh, utterly uh, determined um, and, uh, and persistent, as I said, same before. As I said before, same with uh, uh, road trauma. Then, then um, you know, here we are in 1970. If we'd kept at those levels of, uh, of death, even without uh, taking into account the numbers that increased, then probably 60,000 people uh, more would have died. Over 600,000 more people would have had serious, nasty, long-term uh, injuries. So this is where public health can work, um, and we know it can work, but it is... It does take time and it does take a lot of uh, persistence. Gathering evidence. <clears throat> the thing is that evidence is obviously on our side. But it's just not enough. It's not sufficient. Um, we, we know there are lots of programs where we have the evidence and policy isn't implemented. Uh, just a classic is obviously climate change, but it's also in a whole lot of other areas. One is, is in alcohol policy. Um, or we have others where no evidence for what is being done, um, the war on drugs, it doesn't work. So we have to be not only good at evidence, and I think we, in a sense, as doctors for the environment, want to in some ways be there with white coats on, with stethoscopes around our neck, and we're producing, this is, we're gonna work out where our, our role is in the, in, the, in the number of players working uh, on climate change. We have to work out where are we best placed in this. Um, but we have to work with others in, uh, in a constituency. So creating a constituency, we have to work out where are the other like-minded organisations, where are the opinion leaders, people who have voices anyway by virtue of who they are. Um, we also have to find out about community opinion. Um, and we want to track community opinion to find out what people really do think about, uh, about these issues because that does help uh, our arguments. Although, as we'll see, um, you can get very high levels of community opinion for something, it may not necessarily happen. A good example of this is what parents want done about restricting advertising of junk food to their kids. It's, it's well over 80, 90% for most avenues of advertising that parents want something done about this, yet they can't get it done. And the reason is that that other sort of bit who, who, um, who are against all of this have very major influence uh, because they're most likely, and as we, we know in this area, they are the industries. Um, and the industries are not only in the case of food, uh, it's not only the industry themselves, the manufacturers, but it's the retailers that have an interest in this, it's their PR agencies, it's their advertising agencies, and it's the media themselves. Why? Because the media uses the manufacturers to actually, ad they advertise in their, in, in, in their papers or on their television shows. So this is a, we are faced in the sort of the 21st century with some difficult um, conundra. So uh, we have to try and think our way through, uh, uh, through a number of these. So creating constituent, I think we have to learn better how our, and know how our political systems work. Where can we make a point? Where can we put pressure? Um, where can we understand, um, even in our local area, our local province or state or, or country or our culture, where, where can we make a difference? And actually finding people who know this well and, and do it well, you may not feel easy about this yourself, um, you know, may not feel easy uh, trying to understand this, you're saying, well, look, I'm a, I'm a doctor, uh, I'm a health professional, I don't do this other stuff very well, I'm not political by nature, it doesn't matter, find someone who is good at this sort of stuff, who is good at uh, working out how the system works. Because as Fiona was saying, we need to influence it. Unless we can get the numbers, literally get the numbers in Parliament, we don't get uh, a fundamental um, influence, a, a ability to influence um, the climate change debate and, and pick up on all those issues that Fiona was, was talking about. If you are going to go in the media, um, then remember that's a double-edged sword. Um, you live and die, you may live and die by it. Um, I have a little sort of, I wear on this huge badge of honour being attacked by Andrew Bolt. Um, this is one of the things I, I uh, you know, thank you. 
Uh, I mean, this is someone who, who has enormous influence, unfortunately, um, will uh, we'll go at any particular uh, uh, opinion that's against his um, and use the enormous power of the Murdoch press to, uh, uh, because he creates good controversy, I mean, he's a, in a sense, he's a very good journalist, um, because of that, con well, not a good journalist, but he's ones that sell papers, uh, and that's what are thought to be good journalists these days. Um, but as uh, Mae West says, better be, over, be looked over than overlooked. So you want to be out there, you, then you, but you will get your, you stick your head above the parapets, then someone will certainly uh, shoot at you. Don't worry about that, that's fine. Um, getting your voice heard, some methods you can use, and this is changing. Um, and a lot of you in this room are much smarter than I am at, at this, but uh, whether you're looking at uh, Avars, change.org, um, these other groups that are doing online petitions, crowdsourcing, um, you can use standard opinion editorials. Of course, it's hard to get into uh, and on some, uh, some of these simply because of the biases of, of, uh, uh, of some of our uh, main press um, letters to the editor, but be there, be there. I mean, someone like Simon Chapman, for example, who's a, you know, you will know probably because he's working in tobacco, but on gun reform and on, on uh, wind farms, you know, he's constantly writing letters to the paper. It's, it's constantly out there. It's not a question of sitting there waiting for something to happen. Um, he's preparing all the time. Peer-reviewed journals, um, they do really have, as we've seen just with the, the Lancet article, it really does make it a difference. Um, the other thing you can do is, is also just using international information all the time, create local um, action groups, or you can um, have your own events or major stunts. And my favourite one, uh, which maybe in my next life I would have the, the wherewithal to actually think of this one, um, but it's the Breast Cancer Network of Australia. What you do is, is work out how many women have breast cancer, you dress them in pink and you get them to sit in the middle of the MCG and you get a helicopter to take a photo of it and that goes absolutely viral. Um, it's become the sort of driving image around, uh, around breast cancer, um, invented by a wonderful woman called Lynn Swinburne who started the Breast Cancer Network of Australia with a membership of one, which was obviously her, I think it's now over 80,000 people. Uh, and that's in about 14 years. So very impressive. This can be done. Uh, we can unite. Uh, we can have our voices uh, heard. Who are we fighting against? Um, then, in this case, we are fighting against very strong, powerful, vested interests. As Fiona was suggesting, these are economic issues. The biggest fight and the patch over it that we're fighting over is around economics. It's around who's making money and where are they making money and how much is being made. This is not so much a, a moral argument. Uh, it's, for me, it's, a, it's an economic argument. As, and it's, a, it's an argument of I want my money and I'm going to protect everything I can do because this is the way I make it. And unfortunately, Australia has such huge uh, fossil fuel resor um, reserves. And that's one of our... That has stopped, in a sense, our development of our thinking around alternative energies because we have such huge resources of, uh, of fossil fuel. Um, so when we're looking at this, then, you know, we've got to line up against business industry associations. You saw what happened to the mining tax uh, and the opposition to the, to, the, uh, to the carbon tax. Then this is some powerful, really powerful lobby groups. Uh, maybe religious groups, but the, the lobbyists actually in town. I know that when I go and see the health minister and and Linda, when we were with, with the Preventive Health Task Force, that we, we, we'd see the minister, we could be pretty sure that the industry groups were there before us and they're there after us. Um, and, and they're there also offering all sorts of, in a sense, ways of, of peddling influence, which is around you know, sports sponsorship, which is around so-called corporate social responsibility, uh, which is around uh, entertainment, um, they do it extraordinarily well. They're, they're, they're artists at, uh, uh, at this. We've just got to be able to play in the same, uh, in the same sandpit. Um, as I mentioned before, the advertisers, the PR agencies, uh, Hill and Knowlton, uh, who, who were known for their pretty horrendous work uh, supporting the tobacco industry are the ones that now support Coca-Cola uh, in terms of, of their, their major PR work. Uh, and as I said, the media themselves. Um, because when they have a vested interest in, in the outcome of this, 
then they're no longer an objective source of information because they're a player. Um, and you know, we can see what's happened in, in tobacco. Uh, these are the heads of the agencies swearing in front of Congress that, that uh, it didn't cause cancer and it wasn't addictive. Um, and of course, remember that more doctors smoke camel than any other cigarette. Um, I mean, this is what we thought then. This is quite, these are the um, enormous objections put up and still put up by the industry. Just remember in, in Indonesia, 40% of 13 to 15 year old boys smoke. 67% of Indonesian men smoke. This is when we know here how dangerous this is and we can't stop that industry being so strong literally seven hours north of us by plane. The arguments against seatbelts, for example, 40 years ago was an infringement of uh, individual liberty or that people put on seatbelts, then they drive faster. Uh, these are a lot of arguments that were used and are continually used to uh, undermine um, public health efforts. Um, or the cholera outbreaks, Jon Snow. Um, and you know, it took him 20, 30 years. It wasn't just in 1854 when the cholera outbreak happened that he suddenly went bingo and ripped the handle off the, uh, off the Broad Street pump. He'd been at it for years. He was really persistent uh, and he had enormous opposition. So don't be afraid of opposition. So the Board of Health said, you know, we see no uh, reason to adopt this belief uh, and shrugged off Snow, Snow's evidence as mere suggestions. And of course, the other thing about this, when you read a little more closely as to why people were against him, is there were two water companies involved in this, one of which where the major problem was happening, one of which wasn't. But they didn't want to change their, they didn't want to invest money in changing um, their system at all. So they were pretty, as I can understand, pretty, pretty influential in, uh, um, in trying to uh, uh, dis discount Snow's, um, Snow's work. Now here's another thing. What issue is this set about? What were these objections about? Financial stakeholders, health, so giving a benefits element, elements of the economy relied on it. Business persons didn't want to sacrifice profits. Their elected representatives didn't want it to sacrifice votes. The royal family opposed it. Even one of the country's greatest heroes denounced the damnable doctrine and the hypocritical allies. What is it? Slavery, Slavery yes. So this is, what, this is what was said hundreds of years ago um, about uh, uh, you know, and the economics of something that we see now as being utterly abominable. Um, and economics is such a powerful argument. It's such a dominant, power, sort of dominant part of our discourse now. We have to work out ways of, of dealing with this um, and, and making our, our verse, voices heard. There's a wonderful, um, and I'll, I'll get it to you, if you haven't seen this, um, it's, a, it's a, a piece done called Smoke and Mirrors and Hot Air, The Big Oil and Big Climate Change, how Exxon Mobil has, uses big uh, tobacco's tactics to manufacture uncertainty of climate science. So very well documented how they create front organisations, um, how they uh, invest in creating doubt, challenging science, um, funding champions, funding uh, uh, research. Uh, we see this also in the area of alcohol and junk food as well. We're seeing exactly the same tactics. Um, and they're very good at it. They've in fact learnt from the objections we had with around tobacco um, and, and have learnt from that. So uh, they're not, as I said, they're not, they're, not sitting, uh, they're not sitting still. How we frame a debate is, is utterly important. I mean, this is how, again, coming back to Simon Chapman, how some of the debate around tobacco has been framed, um, which is, I just like it because in a sense he's using the emotive language that's always used um, uh, in many ways uh, against public health interests. So this is about a highly researched, beguiling and deadly tune whistle, which is all about the Pied Piper, obviously, uh, whistled to the nation's children by faceless, in other words, gutless, transnational, they don't belong here, interested only in profit maximisation, they're greedy. Um, so that's a pretty good framing of, of uh, what these people are like. And that's why the tobacco industry is now on the bottom of the World Reputation Index. So they've fought their way to the bottom. Um, and, uh, and, well, they might stay there, but the energy's, I think, uh, getting pretty close. Um, another way of interesting where it's been framed very well was the age in South Africa was, was, was when the, all the big pharma uh, took 
the uh, South African uh, government to court over trying to provide cheaper uh, antiretrovirals. Um, and that, again, was framed by people like Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, UNAIDS, uh, and they got to the people in pharmacy companies and said, how dare you do this? You know, you think you're doing the right thing by population by providing antiretroviral drugs, yet you're trying to stop um, access to, uh, to people in sub-Saharan Africa. So they, had, they framed it very well. They used um, very good tactics, and it is tactics. Um, who's framing your argument? You've got to remember that. This is only something I'm even learning now. I don't know, some of you will have been involved in the uh, demonstrations two weeks ago um, against the Abbott government. Now, this was reported in, in Melbourne. It was reported online by um, News Limited in a very short article. It wasn't reported at all in the Herald Sun the next day. Did not crack a mention. Created a fairly, fairly small mention in the, uh, in the Fairfax. I think there were something like 30,000 people there. So it was a pretty big deal. However, it was reported on, new, on um, Sky the next day. Um, what they did was just pick out the weirdest um, banners or the weirdest signs to say, well, look what a bunch of kooks these were. So there's nothing, quite, nothing about why was there, people were there or what, were they, what, was, you know, what was the things that brought people uh, and com what were they actually complaining about, what was the, what was the issue at hand. It was, it was, they were framing this um, whole debate or this whole demonstration with something like 30,000 in Melbourne um, as, as about oddballs. So you have to be very careful and, and in a sense the Murdoch press in particular in Australia because it has so much power and has enormous bias. Um, read Robert Mann's article in, in the monthly about who's actually counted the number of articles for and against um, uh, you know, sort of man-made climate change um, and, you know, as against the actual science around this, you'll find enormous distortions. Enormous distortions. So political correctness now has changed. Politically, political correctness is now about climate denial. It's not about climate science. Political correctness has shifted. And there are enormous biases, you know, I think, in our... Uh, um, particularly from... Uh, uh, from the Murdoch press, both in Australia, but also obviously uh, in the US as, um, as well. So the, this makes the situation uh, pretty difficult. On the other hand, you know, this is a campaign. Uh, know your objective, who has to be convinced, who are the enemies, what evidence do we need, use constituency alliances, getting the numbers, using the media as effectively as we can, and particularly now, obviously, online media. Um, I don't know if you recently saw the changes around the uh, late night alcohol outlets in New South Wales. The thing that really triggered that, well, underneath it is, is enormous amount of work that's gone on for 10 or 15 years, but it was a change.org uh, um, uh, petition, I think, that had 140,000 people signed up to it, which was the one that really actually got, it, uh, got Mr O'Farrell moving to change to, to allow uh, or to, to make sure that um, uh, some of the, the clubs ch uh, shut early and shut at, at 3 o'clock. Um, so it was actually community activism that, uh, uh, that did result in, uh, in change. Um, just to remind you about persistence, then Nigel Gray, who was the head of the Cancer Council, who started Vic Health using a tax on tobacco to buy out sports sponsorship in uh, sports and the arts, um, then it, uh, it took him eight health ministers before he found one who was, um, who was prepared to, to back this idea. So he had, in his back pocket, because uh, then he had three days to, to actually get something to the government about this, but he was always ready. So the point is, um, you have to be ready to do this. Um, and if you think things are against you from a, I guess, from a... a um, uh, overall political perspective that, you know, that, that maybe the government of the day uh, isn't supportive of what we want to do, well, that's exactly the time to prepare. It's exactly the time to be getting even better and better at this um, and waiting things. You will lose sometimes. Just get up and keep going. There's absolutely no doubt. <laughs> Might lose more often than we think. Um, but the point is, um, it is about persistence, persistence, persistence. These are the other areas um, where, whether it's tobacco, food, uh, 
junk drinks, gambling, uh, alcohol are all major challenges. And um, you know, these, these, we will get there for a healthy Australia, I'm absolutely convinced. And we will for climate change. It'll just take a lot of time, a lot of effort. And the more we put in now, um, the quicker it will come. So to leave you with uh, my key message, three Ps, persistence, persistence, and persistence. Good on you, thanks. Thank you very much, Rob, for a fantastic presentation. I've been told I've got, we've got time for two to three questions. We do have one um, that has been texted, so I'll read that first. Um, this comes from Michael Ordens. Um, could you please comment about what we can do to get the Health Star rating website back online? This is surely a powerful incident, instance of undue corporate influence degrading public health initiatives. What can we do? Uh, great comment. Uh, those of you, you will know that that was taken down, uh, again, by influence of, of the company's vested interests. The point about this is to both act, I think, locally and, as Fiona says, get get to your local member. That actually works. I mean, local members actually have to, do have to respond. Um, and also use whatever avenues you have through, through organisations, either through DA or through, through others, um, to either have your voice heard or to use Twitter. I mean, it's interesting, the, the, uh, um, um, the New Zealand Gambling uh, Foundation was, I think, closed down two days ago. Sam Thomas from Wollongong has been on Twitter constantly to Peter Dutton about why, you know, is this going to happen in Australia? Are we using an addiction model of gambling or do we want a preventive model? So, I mean, you can, you can use different avenues to, uh, to have your voice heard. Um, those of you who are, who are better on Twitter or better on, on Facebook or, or better uh, on particular forms of media, then please use them. Talk to each other, work out how to do that. Um, but the last thing we want to do is to think that, oh, well, it's happened and we can't do anything. Because if they never hear any objection, then it's very easy to do that again. Thanks. Um, one, two more, over here. You reckon there's any strategic use for anger? Um, <laughs> I, got, I lost it yesterday and I've been up all night writing an, uh, an email to Greg Hunt about why he should resign. Um, <laughs> Do you, no, do, you think I, no. you, do you think you do the cause damage, or is there a place for really sort of letting them have it? Um, I, I, well, personally, I use anger to fuel the fire in my belly, first of all. So, in other words, to get me out of bed on an issue, then, then anger's really, I'm really pissed off uh, with whatever's going on, and I'm going to do something. Question about how you you then use that tactically, then you have to think about it tactically. You know, I would always um, put an email in the inbox overnight and let it cool. Um, because your language is probably going to be a lot smarter and a lot cleverer the next day than it is when you're just doing off, off emotion. It's going, to be, it's going to be more piercing as to why Greg Hunt should resign um, rather than, than he's, you should resign because I don't like you and you're really silly, um, <laughs> which is not a good idea. Uh, and I may not be right um, also. Uh, so I think that, that working out, using anger as, in a sense, uh, as a constant driving force around persistence, keeping that fire in your belly, the point is... Science is on our side. Either fortunately or unfortunately, we're going to be right. That's what is, is, is um, uh, I think, is, is true. Thanks. And last question over here. Thank you for your talk. Um, I've been discussing climate change with some of my non-medical friends. And while they understand the science of climate change and the reasons why we have to um, get onto it, um, they talk a lot about the costs of investing and implementing in more renewable energy, such as um, the loss of local jobs and economy due to cheaper products from overseas and um, fair trade laws, and um, also the potential use of immense amounts of fossil fuels to create the renewable energy sources and systems. So how do we frame it in a way that 
I guess, puts a positive spin on it and shows people that um, this is something we need to do without affecting Destroying the, the economy. economy. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, that, and this is why it does come down to really an economic argument. So we have to, I think, uh, A, learn from what's going on in other parts of the world where they are having much more constructive um, debates and investments and and thinking around this. I mean, as I say, one of our big problems is because we have such a large fossil fuel industry, so therefore we don't we default to to thinking about that rather than uh, rather than renewable energy. So I mean, I think we have to think through those arguments because they're there. We have to deal with them. We have to be able to argue uh, around the economics of it rather than just the healthcare or the or the environmental aspects. Um, and the last thing we have to be really, really good about is about hope. You know, we cannot take hope away from people uh, in terms of how we manage this. Doomsday, you know, it will work to a certain extent, but, um, you know, we have, to, we have to think creatively about how we provide um, hope for a, uh, for a better planet. I just loved that thing last week, you know, there's no planet B. Um, I just thought that was lovely. Um, apparently the morning tea hasn't arrived yet, so we can have the advantage of that is that we can get some more time out of Rob. So any other questions? Um, Tim? I've, I've never been a stand-in for morning tea before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, Rob. Uh, is that on? Yep. Um, I, we did have a bit of a discussion yesterday also about how to frame it, hopefully, but I just wonder whether we still are a little bit ignoring the fact that one of the big things we have to do is to reframe how uh, we see our future and how the population in Australia sees its own future to reduce the, um, the rampant materialism and individualism that is actually basically our current culture. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and that's where it cut a, cuts across a lot of other issues around, um, um, uh, around what we're doing as a, as a nation. Um, and in, I mean, to, to, to really to value community, to, I mean, it's all the things that Fiona was talking about, about civil society and, and uncivil society. I mean, if, we'd, if we were pushing, obviously, very strongly for all the things that are around a civil society, that, that solves those issues. Um, so we have to work out tactically what's the best way about going about this so that we, you know, we get to a civil society uh, and we, we manage climate change at the same time, because, I mean, they obviously go hand in hand. Um, and, you know, doctors for the environment, doctors have an enormously important part to play in this. Um, and thinking, strategising, grouping, um, using evidence, building the evidence around other uh, economic arguments, uh, that takes time. But on the other hand, uh, we, have to, we have to go through all those steps, I think. Peter? Okay, Rob. Thank you very much for a really, you know, inspiring talk, and I loved hearing that. Um, two things. One, another P just to alter your persistence a bit. So what about preparation, persistence, persistence? That seems to be a message. Absolutely, yeah. But, you know, you say it takes decades, lots of time. This is the critical decade. We don't have lots of time. Any ideas? Um, no, no, I mean, I, it, it was the same thing we would have said about tobacco in the 60s and 70s, and, and, and they were right then. Um, and, um, you know... The notion of preparation is absolutely crucial because you may just get, you may get a, 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 a serendipitous change. Um, and that's why the notion of organisation uh, is utterly important. The notice, notion of, of getting people with the right skills who are good at mounting campaigns, because uh, this is what this is. Um, and, but that campaign has to go for 20 years and be prepared to go for 20 years, not get, oh, well, we go for a couple of years and then, you know, run out of puff. Uh, it's got to get better and better at building, uh, building numbers, building, you know, building each other's sense of capacity that we can actually manage this rather than thinking, oh, you know, 
new mobs of power, we can't do anything. Well, yes, we can. We can keep acting, we can keep acting, we can keep um, uh, working out how we can uh, invent new strategies, how we can use media in different ways to uh, uh, basically bring a... You know, you're, you're shifting 5 to 10% of the population, really, to get the numbers. You're not shifting 60% of the population. Sometimes we underestimate, we overestimate how many people really have to be shifted to get the numbers. I'm told morning tea is now available. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sure you will all like to join me in thanking Rob for his amazing presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.